Track 16 is very happy to host 11 artists from the Binder of Women Collective in the exhibition titled, If Everything is an Outrage. Let's spend a little time looking at each of the artists in the show. First up is Yasmin Nasser Diaz, uh, who is originally from Chicago and raised by Yemeni parents. And her, her work often reflects the you know, personal histories of the clashing culture she was raised in. Yasmin wrote something uh, about this new kind of wild series um, uh, that I'll, I'll read some of. This new ongoing series titled Nathotaxa, a futuristic science fiction narrative I'm developing, is influenced equally by the resilience of desert plants and turbulent trends in human history. It is set in the year 2250, when plant-human hybrids dominate life on Earth. Humans continued to plunder and strip the planet of natural resources. As a means of reclaiming their home, species of cacti and succulents evolved to develop the ability of digesting human flesh while retaining the use of limbs and other body parts. Uh, the plants are the dominant part of this new hybrid beings that result. The first job Bruno Masadas ever had was being a face painter at TGI Fridays. Masadas says, I was intimately close to people's faces and skin, transforming babies' cheeks into butterflies and drunk men's biceps into the L.A. Dodgers logo. These people told me about their lives and I told them about mine. The experience was playful and shamelessly social, exactly how I view my painting practice today. She finds faces in a blank canvas the way others might find them in a cloud or a piece of burnt toast. She sees her canvas and knows she will paint a face, even if she doesn't know what it will look like. Her inspiration has sometimes mused on things like the space between SpongeBob's teeth, the thin, dark, sharpie eyebrow of a Southern California chola, and the boat-shaped eyes of Picasso's weeping woman. Masada says, to make a portrait is to experiment, to find an identity within the composition, to develop a character with color, shape, and line. And finally, it's to meet someone new. Julia Schwartz relates to Keats's idea of negative capability, which acknowledges our inability to process the world whole or find a unifying concept to human experience. She says, this is quite compatible with being essentially self-taught. So she, without benefit or burden of formal technique, is comfortable with uncertainty and doubt and infinite freedom to fail. Schwartz relishes the exalted sublimity of oil on canvas, but also the humble, such as gouache on book pages and sharpie markers on envelopes. These two small works on canvas came after a year's hiatus from painting, a transition back that, that still incorporates some sharpie markers. Schwartz says she's trying to make sense of the senselessness of the everyday world and its outsized seismic disasters, including personal loss and grief, profound political and cultural fragmentation, and most recently, the crumbling of the world as we have known it and the reverberations that are to come. Ginger Wolf Suarez is an artist and curator who has been based in the San Francisco area, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. She's currently in Atlanta serving as a curator and interim director of the Zuckerman Museum of Art. In this series called Breath of Work, she collected raw materials from a variety of beaches and oceans, then slowly extracted dyes from the collected objects. These fine silk panels are pigmented with brownish dyes. These long veins of stain create patterns like topography or reminiscent of audio waveforms. The palette, like stains of bodily fluid, challenge the viewers. The seaside matter processed into dyes lives on statically on Wolf Suarez's phantom shimmering panels. As much as we might valiantly attempt it, there is much in our world that cannot be communicated with words. Rima Galoom's work expresses through the deep connection between emotion and her medium. Galoom says, the ways in which one sees, feels, recalls, and absorbs an experience fascinates me and I consider how this can be translated and transformed through painting. I make paintings that inform one another, resulting in the visual language that generates subsequent work. The space in her paintings emerge as she slowly builds up the surface with thin stains of paint, with sanding in between. Pattern and shapes are manifested through this process. She says, Like cellular memory, this allows for the memory of the painting to be subtly visible, appearing and then dissolving, creating a surface that breathes and remembers. The paintings begin to appear slightly sculptural, while still remaining in a state of becoming, shifting and transforming. The goal of Galoom's paintings is to transform the viewer and make them feel something deep within. We'll look at the work of Galia Lin, 
whose focus on ritual and archaeology is clearly reflected in this piece, The Horned One. It's part of her continuing series of guardians, and I always ponder the ways different people are experiencing these guardians. Can we be as connected to this kind of representation as ancient peoples were? Are these physical representations of powerful spirits for us to absorb? Or is the viewer to inject, you know, self-define the aureole of its presence? And whether from a religious or a secular point of view, her pieces invoke a very primal connection to the world. In her newer Intention series, the clay grows roots around the broken kiln shelves. The shelf, you know, destroyed in service of firing the clay, then in turn is embraced you know, evoking a, a, a life-death cycle. And through these transformations, Lynn aims to reinforce our relationship between our bodies and the earth. In the series Strange Rituals, the artist explores the idea of a future relic. Like remnants of archaic friezes or semiotic tablets, these fragments are etched with 21st century symbology. Stemming from her biracial heritage, Serana Mera became fascinated by how colonial collecting designated sacred objects with alien meanings and that their original use became obfuscated. Each piece is based on an actual person or iconography. As if dug up and eroded over time, Starbucks man, in his recognizable contrapposto, the ubiquitous coffee-holding pose, is a totem to consumerism and capitalism. In her work entitled Glacier, which was rendered from an emoji, uh, the artist posits that the symbol will outlive the natural phenomenon. Like Glacier, which has become a symbol that defines humanity's relationship to a disintegration of our environment, each piece nods at the contemporary customs that are leading to the destruction of both nature and civilization. Erin Morrison has devoted herself to a process of casting hand-cut stencils with gypsum cement that produce low-level relief surfaces. The surfaces are inspired by her fascination with material hierarchies, where she explores faux finish techniques, patination, and the finish fetish tendencies of light and space artists. Here, in Red Veil, Morrison is reflecting on the preverbal language she was experiencing with her infant son. In expanding upon a series of hand relief she'd made prior, in this work, she made the hands active. The task is unclear, um, and the hands, disembodied, become part of a still life. Odalisk Pulse is one of a series of three vaginal reliefs. This one employs a faux flesh tone surface to mockingly replicate the color of a vagina sex toy. The Odalisk became a popular subject in 19th century painting, where they were portrayed in defenseless, submissive positions. Morrison shifts this context into a personalized reflection on the complexities of sex as an action and as an object. Michelle Blade presents two acrylic ink-based paintings on satin that explore a mythologized feminine relationship between nature, knowledge, and community. Sheer in nature, these ethereal works depict scenes in dreamlike shades of pink, blue, and yellow. Female and snake forms move through charged landscapes, their auras bleeding outward, and their surroundings bleeding inward, showing a oneness with their surroundings. The painting Pansy serves as a playful double entendre, implying that the biblical character Eve, portrayed here, is both a flower and a weakling. Instead, Blade presents Eve gazing invitingly into the eyes of the serpent, both bodies mirroring the other, locked in a confrontational and curious stance. They are linked in their quest for knowledge and the unknown. Through this work and snake dance, Blade steers our attention to the synchronicity humans share in their thirst for the creation of meaning in our immediate and tangible realities. Kaisa Johnson explores you know, patterns in nature that exist at the extremes of scale. Uh, so she creates you know, microscopic or macroscopic landscapes. You know, they, they depict the physical reality that's invisible to the naked eye. This recent uh, crude series refers to petroleum. And in this piece, Blow Up 413, she's depicting the phytoplankton whose fossils become the raw stuff that is liquefied into oil after millions of years alive in the Mesozoic seas. It's loosely based on a painting by Monet, as you can see. His Water Lily series was made during and in response to World War I, the first major war run on oil. In this painting, Blow Up 414, she uses particle decay patterns to build up an image of the cone nebula. It's in the ultraviolet light of nebulae that hydrocarbons, that stuff we break apart to release energy from oil, are born from. Jana Ireland unconsciously finds connections as she creates. This work entitled Estate 
is a continuation of a series taken at the home of her husband's grandfather. Ireland says, The big quiet house in the valley was like a private set and provided an incredible opportunity to dig into the themes that are central to my work. Domesticity, isolation, black identity, and the performance of femininity. For this later work in the series, she had begun taking portraits involving her husband and sons. This time, she says, the line between truth and fantasy is less defined. Here we have a modern family, separate but connected. They visit here weekly, but are they out of place? Are the images of the oranges and insects from the wonder of a child's point of view, or the existential foreboding of an adult ruminating on generational cycles? Ireland says, these pictures will help me process my anxiety about what the future will hold for all of us.